All right, welcome back to OK Computer. I am joined by Rick Heitzman, he's the founder and managing partner at First Mark Capital, and Josh Wolf, back to the pod, founder and managing director at Lux Capital. Josh, welcome back. Back in the pod, good to see you. <laughs> it's been, Rick, we, this was one of the first uh, interviews I think that we did. This was in um, July of 2022, um, and it was just, uh, Josh was on our hit list of, of somebody we had to get on, uh, a whole host of reasons. I mean, I think um, the unique nature of your focus as it relates to um, investing in the private markets, but also your worldview and then also, you know, a lot of what you guys uh, grew up together uh, actually kind of helped build the VC community here in New York. So we spent a lot of time on that. I'd love to revisit some of the themes that we talked about. It's been 18 months, which is crazy. And it's a really different world since then. And, it's and been some, a roller coaster. It, well, it really has. And I think some of the things that you guys both said about the private markets and what was going to happen in this new rate paradigm that we were in. Um, and, and now on the flip side of that, we're seeing that kind of unwound a little bit. And I'd love to hear a little bit about thoughts on venture and some of the things that you're talking to about the companies in your portfolios and that you're advising and the like and and, and what you kind of think for 2024. But I kind of want to start with the macro and geopolitical because I think, you know, I think of these things through the lens of the public markets quite frequently. Um, I think you guys have a really interesting take because, you know, the cost of capital is important in both of these markets. Sometimes they can be totally disregarded in the public markets. And I think that's what's going on right now. But I'd love to maybe take it back a little bit. Um, at the time, in July of 2022, guys, and the markets were throes of a bear market. I think the sentiment in the private markets also felt pretty bearish in a way. We had a 10-year yield was at 3%, okay? Right now it's at 4%-ish, okay? We had a Fed funds rate at 2.5% on its way to the upper bound right now at 5.5%. Now, the spark in equities that we've seen over the last few weeks or so in the public markets has to do with the fact that the Fed is going to be aggressively lowering interest rates next year. So, Josh, let's talk a little bit about rates, okay? And I think if you are listening to this and you uh, are through the lens of a VC or a private market founder or... Or you're a public market investor, you care about rates right now because that is the one thing moving risk assets around. Does that make sense to you or am I putting too fine a point on this? 100%. Low rates uh, produce an overestimation of genius in yeah. these bull markets, right? I mean, that's what we had a year and a half ago. Everybody thought they were geniuses. Every company was doing great. You had high marks. LPs were flush. They were reporting record high, you know, on paper returns. Uh, high rates, suddenly you have an underestimation of the amount of shock that people have, the amount of stress, the amount of internal triage that people are focusing on their portfolios, uh, down marks on companies. One of the big things, by the way, in venture, maybe we'll get to this specifically, is, and this is probably the most provocative thing I'll say, 50% of venture firms that exist today, I think in the next five years, will not be here. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't have net new venture firms entering, but a huge destruction of the number of firms. And a lot of people say, well, you know, you've got 10-year lock capital and the economic structure of these things mean that the persistence of them is going to be very high. But they forget about one thing, which is the Shakespearean nature of firms. You have a group of people, often men, and they are vainglorious and petty and have jealousies. And when all of a sudden- Politics of venture. Wait, why, why are you staring it's true. at Rick? <laughs> for, for the <laughs> listener here. We, we, we haven't had any drama. We're, yeah. you know, we, we, we compete, we cooperate. Yeah. We, we, we've, had, we've had nothing but, uh, nothing but mutual respect and admiration. But inside firms, you can see this. And, and people are like, this isn't going to happen. Literally, I think three days after I tweeted this out publicly, part be provocative, but part because I've been saying this for a while, a firm up in Boston, without even name checking them, decided that they're shutting down. They just raised several hundred million dollars. They have fresh pool of capital. Why? Because all of a sudden, some old funds are not in carry, meaning that they're no longer profitable. People are not going to get paid. You're sitting there every day. You brush your teeth. You're deciding I'm going into the office and you feel like that vomiting feeling. Like, I can't stand these people. And people decide, I'm going to fracture. I'm going to split off. I'm going to do my own thing. Two people are going to leave. Three people are going to leave. You were going to see an abundance of that. And LPs that have been sitting by passively, basically doing manager selection, I think are going to start to get involved and say, wait a second, you know, the LPAC, the uh, Limited Partner Advisory Committee, is starting to get very active and start to decide what's going to happen at some of these firms. So the pendulum is going to swing back towards the allocators in that sense. And that is all because rates have risen. Mm -hmm. Rates have risen and all of a sudden valuations are coming down. It's going to flow down like the champagne glasses into the chaos of humanity that occurs inside of partnerships. I completely agree. And then you're going to see reformation. Yes. And so you're going to see the young person whose golden handcuffs they thought they had two years ago and why they couldn't leave the firm that was going to blow up. There's no reason not to walk across the street. So they're going to find another young person who's equally hungry, equally willing to take on that risk and say, hey, Josh, you want to walk across the street and we'll call our LPAC and start something fresh and leave this all behind. And that's going to be the creative destruction. And you see it across asset allocators. You see it in high watermarks and hedge funds. 
You see it across the world. And that's the phase of the venture market we're going through today. And that destruction is going to create a lot of turmoil, especially for the underlying portfolio companies. What, what you guys found before we get to the portfolio companies, as far as investors are concerned, you guys are mentors to, uh, you probably mentored dozens of you know uh, young VCs uh, who've already had experience doing something else, whether it be in banking or operating or that sort of thing. Um, what do you think the success of some folks when they go out on their own, you know what I mean? Like after they've been under your wing at Lux or First Market, like is it like a high probability of success for someone who is successful under your platform? In some cases, yes. We've had some partners spin out. They've started their own firms. We've been investors in some. Mm -hmm. They've they've gone on to, to achieve success. Some of it is taking their own cultural learnings that we've had at Lux, and some are taking their own things and saying, you know what, we want to do things differently. We mm -hmm. want to go into a different sector, or we want a different stage focus. And I think that I consider Lux a success if we end up with like a long-term, like a Drexel-like diaspora, where mm -hmm. you've built a great firm and you have people that are leaving, they're going and starting their own firms. Whereas, you know, you look at some firms that a lot of people celebrate and you say, well, why haven't people come out of there? Why mm -hmm. haven't they started a firm? And there's something there that either the people you've attracted are sort of yes men that just want to work for somebody else. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. We want people that have a bit of aut autonomy and independence and ambitions, but enough ambitions that they feel like they're part of something special as opposed to the saying, you know what, I don't want to do this or I don't mm -hmm. want to do this here at Lux. But yes, I, th I think that um, uh, every individual has different attributes. When we think about like the success at Lux. We need people that can raise capital, mm -hmm. so attract limited partners. There's a subset of team of that. We need people that can attract entrepreneurs that are shining a beacon light. Some people do that by working the back channels and have intel into what companies are forming and what's happening at other GPs. Some people are out there like me uh, who are more ego-driven, and I want to get my name out there. I've got my ideas. I'm on podcasts with other brilliant people, and, um, and, and people are doing press and media. But we're shining a beacon light appealing to different entrepreneurs. And by the way, at a firm, different entrepreneurs may love a certain partner may hate another partner. There are people yeah. that can't stand my political views or the things that I have to say or find me you know, really annoying when I'm criticizing Elon on Tesla or whatever it is. And there's other people that just like absolutely love some of my other partners. So that is really important. And then you have to add value to these companies. And, you know, how do you do that? Well, some people are really good at technology. They're really good at understanding, here's how I reduce technical risk. There's other people that are really good at financing and they have relationships with other syndicate partners so they could reduce the financing risk. There's other people that are really good at board construction and recruiting people and uh, getting the human capital piece. And there's other people that have relationships with the big companies who are ultimately the buyers or the partners of your investments that you can exit to. And so each one of those things is really valuable. And then there's people that are really good at just like firm building and thinking mm -hmm. about how do we build the reputation of the firm and make it about us, not me. And then sometimes you have some great people inside of firms that are really good, but they're very selfish and focused on themselves. And so these are, you know, high class problems. Yeah. But I think that for somebody that's starting a new firm, you're trying to get that cultural aspect right. I've had an amazing benefit, which I know you as well with founding partners. My co-founder, Peter Aber, is my dispositional opposite. I'm sitting here in black. He's always wearing white. He's optimistic. I'm pessimistic. He invented the airplane. I invented the parachute. It's just this great <laughs> yin and yang of risk and ambition. And we trust each other. And that to me is like in any partnership, in a marriage, in a great friendship, I call it art. Admire, respect, and trust. If you admire somebody, mm -hmm. you, you appreciate what they bring to the table. It's great. If you respect them, you truly are like, wow, I, he or she can do something I can't do. And then you trust them. I literally would trust Peter with my wife, my kids. And that's such a rare thing. You might like somebody. You might sort of respect them, but maybe you don't really trust them that much. Or you might respect and trust them, but you don't really admire them and you sort of criticize them mm -hmm. a lot. It's really important in these kind of partnerships that I think you get all three and then you got a, a, a winning uh, formula. And you have a you have a coaching tree, right? So no different than if you think about the Andy Reid coaching tree or the Bill Walsh coaching trees. We think about it as our coaching tree, and each partnership has to have that mosaic of different personalities, right? The great technical person, the great relationship person, and also founders tend to have to be great salespeople, right? You're selling your LPs, mm -hmm. you're selling when you don't have a name on your card, you're selling your personal track record to what you think are some of the best entrepreneurs. So there's some people that are good at that. There's some people that want to do that. There's some people that have the risk tolerance. There's some people that don't. And you could be a great investor, but you could not have the risk tolerance to move due to family situations. Or, you know, you, do, you like selling, but not necessarily outside of your special space. And so you take pride in both things. You take pride in people you grow within your organization, and hopefully they become culture bearers no different than founders. And you also take pride in people who you spin out, you invest in and you see them build their own firms. Let, let's talk, you mentioned um, creative destruction and reformation. Let's talk about it, what it means on the company front, right? So like when you think about your portfolio, some of these companies and we're seeing it, it seems like daily, you know, like 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 we are hitting some critical periods for companies that just don't have a whole heck of a lot of runway and just the, the rate environment or the, the difficult nature of the economy, whatever it is, right? So when that company was doing their their seed and their A, it looked like a very different environment now. What, what are some of the conversations that you're having? Because I'm, I'm sure you all have 
some companies um, that you're really, it's like, you know, sharpening the pencils right now towards the end of 2023 and thinking about what is going to be increasingly volatile. And, and when we get to the macro, we'll, we'll talk about that 2024, because I think about what's going on, at least in the economy in 2022 and in 2023, and also for the markets, they're almost like a mirror opposite. And when you have that, almost like the, the, the yin and the yang that you just described, what comes next can be very challenging. It can be the thing that's not on anyone's bingo card. So I'm just curious, how are you guys right now um, thinking about some of these companies that you're like, you know, I really am rooting for those guys, but they're not going to make it and we got to figure something out. So uh, a few different levels. One at the fund level, you have what we do is reserves analysis. You're basically looking at how much money do you have that is uninvested and where are you going to allocate those incremental dollars? A purely rational investor will say the highest incremental return on those incremental dollars is where they should go. So if you have a company that you're looking at and you think, well, from here, you know, maybe we recoup our money by putting some money in. Uh, and it's going to be a kick save, but we need to put that in so that we don't take a 20, 30, 40, $50 million loss. That's one rational calculation. The other one is say, we're going to accept that $50 million loss of the total capital. And that might be the carrying value, but maybe we only put in 10 million in. It's currently standing at a 5X uh, mark and it's worth 50 million. And we're willing to basically lose the 10 million of original invested capital because an incremental 10 million might yield us 60 million in another investment. Mm -hmm. So that's at a portfolio construction level, the quantitative analysis that you're doing. But that is also weighted and biased by the human piece of this. Yeah. I can tell you that I can easily look at a company that is in our portfolio that I have no real direct personal connection to. I don't meet the CEO regularly. I'm not sitting on the board. And I can dispassionately look and say, I don't think that this thing's going to work. It's very hard for the partner that has a deep personal relationship. Well, like, ah, you know, I just like I was helping him with this situation. And so that's the virtue of a partnership to both appreciate the humanity of these because there is a positive feedback effect and a negative feedback effect. If you have a reputation for being a really crappy board member or supportive investor, other people say, don't take their money. Uh, if you're amazing, then maybe that company didn't work out, but the entrepreneur comes back and says, you know what? You were like an absolute class act. I would work with you time and time again. And that has a positive value that might not actually be recognizable. So at a portfolio level, you're doing that sort of analysis in the presence of higher cost of capital, valuations coming down, other venture firms that are dealing with this. So the triage amongst them, right? What might be a great portfolio company for Rick and I, if we shared one, might be a um, phenomenal one for somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and what might be a okay investment for us might be like an incredible one for somebody else. So where it sits in your portfolio, if your portfolio is in carry, how much you care about it, how much you need to save this, if you're in a fundraising period and people are trying to like prop up their companies and, and maintain marks versus like taking the honest valuations, all that stuff is like this complex, almost non-modelable uh, psychology of that. And so at the individual company levels, uh, that, that's the portfolio level. The individual company levels, the number one admonishment that we've had for really two plus years now has been three words, husband your cash. Mm -hmm. Save as much cash as you can because you are going to face headwinds. And use that cash, not just defensively, but offensively for the companies that are not husbanding their cash. The people that are going to be running out of money will have great technology, great talent, great channels to market, great customers, and you can acquire those. You can mm -hmm. consolidate them if you have a war chest. So we almost have a tale of two cities, if you were to caricature it. We have some companies that are struggling and we're thinking about how do we off-ramp them how do we find them a home? How do we get a kick save? How do we recycle basically the people and maybe the capital? And then in the other sense, we have really strong war chest balance sheets. Mm -hmm. Company like Anduril and Defense, ascendant stock price, two billion plus of cash. They're doing multiple acquisitions. You can see this momentum for them. In biotech, we have a company called Icon, same sort of phenomenon, hundreds of millions of dollars on the balance sheet at a time when most biotech is absolutely getting crushed. So this idea of consolidation for, for the people that have war chest is a really great strategy. And for all the others, it's basically buy as much time as you can to find a home. So, Rick, I suspect three years ago, these are like themes that you guys were talking about in the throes of the pandemic. And, yes. and you and I were talking, I'm sure you yeah. guys were talking about it and everything. How has that changed right now? Like, for instance, like, 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 you know, back then, Black Swan event, no one knew when it was going to end. And here we are really on the other side of it. But now it's macro that has really thrown it. And some of the disconnects that I think are like an outgrowth of what we went through are, are like, this is what's going on. So, like... Like, are the, the intensity of these conversations that Josh just described, are they greater now? Are they, um, you, know, you know what I mean? Like, well, we're getting to the end. I mean, so we talked about the roller coaster ride, right? We went, we went up, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty st steady going up, going even into the pandemic. And then there was maybe a quarter of the oh shit moment. Like, yeah. where are we? What's going to happen? Is anyone going to buy anything? Is anyone ever going to go to their office again? And then the dramatic cut in rates and propping up at the balance sheet just made the money spurt and flow for two years. And then we started to feel scared. I mean, early days of the pod in the summer of 21, mm -hmm. we we're talking about being scared about, you know, the speed at which people were deploying capital, the ease, the lack of diligence, all those things. So then 
Then he got he got put into the washing machine for the last 18 months. And I think we're coming out of it. I think you're seeing a more normalized environment. You're getting to a more normalized interest rate environment. And yeah, it might go up a little bit up or down, but you're not going to go from 0% mortgage rates to 32-year highs. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have to see these violent changes. And you're, you're going to even seeing the companies that went from growth to profitability kind of really understand their business metrics a little bit better. And the best companies have really gotten fit during that time. So we're moving into, I think it's probably going to be 24 is going to be kind of back to basics and normalization that you say, all right. And again, some of these companies are going to need capital. And I think 24 is still going to be a very challenging fundraising year that a lot of companies that were waiting, trying to hold off to get through this period are now going to have no choice but to go out after two years. And maybe they overraised or, had, or got a little bit lucky, they cut their costs. And so there's going to be a lot more companies raising in 24 than there's capital available. But you know, we're telling our companies, hey, we know this is going to be a hard time. Mm -hmm. But if you stay fit, if you get through this, if you show milestones which earn you the right mm -hmm. to have that capital, mm -hmm. you know, on the other side of this, in 25 and 26, in a normal market, you're going to start seeing IPOs. You're going yeah. to start seeing a more healthy M&A environment. People are going to start paying for the asset you built, and whether that's earnings or a team or a wonderful product. And that's the light. That's the light at the end of the tunnel. So great point. And and Josh, do we have to wait to twenty five and twenty six for those exits? Because if you think about just the flood, you know, and, and maybe it was kind of the the SPAC phenomenon in in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one that we saw a lot of issuance. Right. Um, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of M and A. So when I think about you know a Nasdaq one hundred that is at um, at its prior all time highs, it's up fifty percent on the year. Um, you know, if we get out to a great start next year. If you can't bring a profitable tech company, even at a high valuation public, then I don't know when you're going to be able to bring it. I, you know, and especially when you think about how much um, you know distress there is in the public markets right now for companies that went public in the last few years or so. I, I think that's probably one reason why people are a little apprehensive at the moment. But shouldn't that be a 2024 thing that the IPO market reopens if we have a kind of normalized rate environment. We have inflation back at areas that I think the Fed can feel comfortable about rates lower than where they are right now if we're just thinking about real rates, right? And then we have growth kind of baseline back towards, let's say we have that soft landing. We don't have a recession. We're back toward that 2% sort of GP, uh, GDP flatline sort of thing. Shouldn't that be a great environment for IPOs, M and A, and and all the things that Rick just described that would like maybe, and I, I guess you're just kind of pushing it a little bit, but like being well, a no, I think you're, what you're yeah. I was saying is that you know that should be a good environment, yeah. But you know a lot of these companies are just getting off the roller coaster, yeah. and maybe their stomach's not feeling feeling great. They feel like they got whipsawed. A lot of people thought that the uh, Clavio, Instacart IPOs in the early of September were going to open the markets and everything was going to be fine. That didn't go as planned. Yeah. So. You know, no, not many people, some people are rushing to get done their audits for 23 to be ready yep. in Q2 to go public. And some people are saying, hey, I, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. Let's let's see, let's have some other guys go out. Maybe let's have some smaller folks go out. Yeah. And if everything goes well, I'll be ready to go out in the second half of 24 and 25. But I'm not going to be fooled again. Yeah, that, and that's a great point. I think there was an article um, in the information a couple of weeks ago. It was looking at like the IPO class of 2024. Most of them are like mid single digit billion. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like Josh, does that make sense? Like let's let some of the smaller names that have been around, they, maybe their IPO plans have been pushed off a couple of years. Let's see how they fare in the markets. I, I, I think so. There won't be, in my opinion, a broad passive index like buying of IPOs. It yeah. will be discriminating individual stories, which will then comp and re-rate a whole bunch of other companies where people say, wait a second, you've actually had some somewhat efficient market here, actually scrutinizing and analyzing the fundamentals and saying, what's the right multiple to put on this? There's going to be also sector rotation. People get bored of things that they think were working that didn't work. SaaS, I mean, for 10 years, just absolutely mm -hmm. crushed it. There's sector rotation out of that. Big investors are less interested in that. If you look at the large growth equity investors, a lot of them are getting killed. LPs are not investing in them. They were the marginal buyer pre-IPO or into the IPO as crossover investors into many of these co companies, particularly in software and SaaS. So where are the sectors that I think you're, you're going to see a wave of money going in? Um, there's a few sort of going back to the geopolitical and macro forces that I think are going to define this. One is war. Mm -hmm. I mean, geopolitics, there's, there's, there's always going to be war somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's where the attention is right now. Israel, Gaza, Russia, Ukraine, what happens, China, Taiwan, mm -hmm. et cetera, other hotspots uh, that pop up. The world has awoken that technology and aerospace and defense is a tailwind that is going to be here to stay. Mm -hmm. And you have what I think is 
three or four years of company building and then probably a bubble that I would predict around 2026, 27. Why? You have a few companies, Anduril, Saildrone, a handful that are like Ascendant, getting big revenues, getting big market multiples. People spin off of those. So they work there four or five years. They're fully vested. They have enough confidence. Just like with the venture firm stuff that we were talking about before, they say, I want to start a company. They're backable. Some of the syndicates that are in those uh, 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 companies decide that we're going to back those entrepreneurs. So you get company creation, a whole movement there. You also have fund formation. There are funds right now that are dedicated, whether it's like, you know, Andreessen talking about uh, American dynamism or General Catalyst talking about global resilience, whatever, however people are framing it, you're having funds that are basically deploying dedicated pools of capital. I've spoken to allocators that say, you know what, fund to funds are interesting in the space in part because there's so much activity, number one, happening, but also it gives us some moral distance. Mm -hmm. We had to make a decision when we invested in Andrel. Would we be comfortable with the technology being used in a kill chain? That is never something that we've had to ask ourselves as a partnership. And a lot of people inside the partnership were uncomfortable with that and many were, but we think that it was a moral duty to support American military to do that. So you have people that are basically starting companies, venture funds that are forming explicitly for investing in those companies, fund of funds that are forming for that, all of which means capital formation. You're having a movement of capital formation around aerospace and defense, which is, again, the very roots of venture capital, that will reach, in my estimation, bubble-like proportions yeah. in three or four years. Before we get to defense tech, um, but I want to talk about, like, so, you, you, Rick, you just mentioned it's been a difficult raise environment. And I think, you know, every day we can hear a story, whether it's, um, you know, VC capital, difficult environment. I think the best of the best, you guys have, have done really well raising capital. And, and, and a lot of that has to do with your track record and the like here. But, um, you know, a lot of companies are having a hard time, and maybe that's a valuation-driven sort of thing. When you think about how much capital has rushed to these pre-revenue kind of AI yes. startups, is there a, was there a bubble that, you know, is well-formed now in 2023? Because the capital, I mean, we're talking about tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, actually. Yeah. And so it seemed like that sucked all the air out of the room in 2023. It really kind of propped up the room, right? Because there was a lot of companies, whether they were SaaS companies that people were questioning their market size or they're just companies that weren't working. When you, when you re-rated them on cost of capital, they weren't working. And there was enough capital out there that said, hey, we have to find something new and exciting. And that was AI over the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of propped up the market, kind of propped up what was still a down market. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see you know, some of those companies be called on to actually deliver in 2024. Mm -hmm. And we're going to figure out which which ones are good and which ones are bad. And then we're going to look to, hey, what else is exciting? Because we're going to need something else that's exciting. I definitely think uh, defense and aerospace is going to be exciting. You know, space, the final frontier might have its might have its year in 24. Star uh, Trek guy, not Star Wars. Yeah, I'm a Star Wars guy. I'm a Star Wars guy. I'm a Star Wars guy. OK. Yeah. Um, but uh, and then the evil empire. He's obviously away. Star Wars because he's he's all wearing all black. And, then the and evil your partner's uh, he's the Star Trek guy. Right, right, yeah. The evil empire has to win the World Series then. Exactly. Then uh, we'll see. Go ahead, Josh. The the AI piece is interesting because because Rick is absolutely right. If you think about just like in the public markets, you have the Magnificent Seven that basically you know overcompensated for the mass destruction of everybody else. In venture, the thing if you, when you look at the aggregate numbers, AI basically boosted everything else, right? Yeah. And so you do have the speculative furor into this. We always say that, you know, the five-year psychological bias, you want to be invested today where you should have been five years ago. So as investment managers, we're trying to invest today where we think people are going to want to be in four or five years. Uh, the investments that we made back in the day, Hugging Face, which is like this repository for uh, AI and ML. Like when we invested in this, it wasn't clear what the business model mm -hmm. was going to be. It's an open source thing, which is a big fight in open AI, mm -hmm. right, in, in AI right yeah. now between open source models and regulatory capture and how that shakes out. Um, and, and I'm going to get to your point, by the way, about M&A and exit, because I yeah. think AI is going to see an absolute ton of it. When we invested in companies like Hugging Face, Mosaic, who just got bought by Databricks for a billion three, yeah. uh, Runway ML, these things have been ascendant in recent years. So we love the capital formation that's coming in. We always say, like, we're contrarian. We try to do these kinds of things. We want people to agree with us just later. And that's what's yes. happening now. And so AI is seeing this boom. But it, there's another beneficiary of this, which is um, the oligopolistic structure of the big tech companies that feel an urgency that they need to own this stuff mm -hmm. lest their competitors get it is why you're seeing NVIDIA funding, you know, dozens, if not, you know, nearly 100 companies with the largesse that they've received from selling all these A100 and A100 chips. Uh, Largely up. to China. Uh, well, uh, two, two thirds of the revenue are outside the U.S. and a lot of it's to China. If you think of the stuff that's not exactly earmarked to China, like through gray markets and stuff yes, like and that. Yes, and Singapore and Mid-East yeah, yeah, and elsewhere. Like, well, sure. just, let's, let's call it space. 100%, yeah. which goes back into the geopolitical yeah. uh, implications of that and reshoring and resilience yeah. and a whole bunch of U.S. industries, which I think is another important theme, which will probably lead to, as a friend of mine in the macro world calls, first fire than ice. We're going to see still you know, continued inflation. I want to talk about that. And then a massive deflationary uh, process or result of basically building two of everything in the world. Uh, 
So, so AI, I actually think you will see competition between Microsoft, Google, Meta, Salesforce, NVIDIA, everybody else, basically trying in the scrum to buy up in individual companies. Databricks just bought Mosaic. Microsoft effectively owns OpenAI, as everybody can, now knows. Can the big, can the big plat, the Mag Seven, can they make acquisitions right now? No, that's why like, that's yeah. why OpenAI was structured the way it was. Yeah. Microsoft very pressingly knew, like DOJ would never let them buy yeah. that outright. So the waterfall, the structure, they effectively influence control. It's integrated in all of the products, and that is going to be the big thing on the public markets. That is going to ultimately be telling on the private markets, which is this: Can you get pricing power by introducing Gen AI into your various product suites, whether that's in Adobe, whether mm -hmm. that's in Microsoft, whether that's in Oracle, whatever it is? Are you able to go from $19.99 a month to $24.99 a month in pricing? Or are you able to get cost savings because you've eliminated customer service or somehow you know, reduced costs inside for customers or for, for internal operations? If the answer to both of those things are yes, then it may match the re-rating expectation that people have gotten. Remember, since Microsoft invested uh, you know, $10 billion or committed $10 billion to OpenAI, their market cap increased, not by $10 billion, by a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars. That is the greatest tech trade like mm -hmm. ever made. Obviously, it was you know created for many other things. It wasn't solely because of OpenAI, but a trillion dollars of market cap value because of a $10 billion commitment to OpenAI and all that, that came from that. So I think you are going to see, going back to the M&A question, a lot of M&A in these early players in OpenAI, as much for the tech and the teams, at a time when everybody's trying to build these proprietary models and you're going to have a ton of open source stuff that basically makes this stuff irrelevant. I, I want to take a step back. I think what you said is really important. Okay, so they started out this year and Microsoft committed uh, $10 billion. In and, January. And a lot of it was going to come back to them through their, their the, you know, cloud through effort. Cloud sure, right. right, so yep. it was a genius trick for genius. all intents yes. and purposes. But here's the thing I want to say, because you guys understand the, you know, the capital allocation business, right? So there are 10 stocks that make up over 30% of the S&P 500. They make up 50% of the NASDAQ 100. When you think of passive investing and the way flows are coming, those 10 stocks, they're soaking it all up. And yep. I heard a stat earlier this week that 70%, if you are indexing to global equities, is going to the US. So then do that math, yes. okay? So there is a massive bubble that is forming. You just had to answer two questions that would work for all of these um, companies. If you can a, get pricing power and then efficiencies in yes. your own businesses, then it works. So my, you know, I guess my thesis right here is that if we have a NASDAQ at new all-time highs, it's pulled forward all of the excitement, okay, about everything that is to happen over the next 10 years, which is not too different than what happened in the late 90s in and around the internet. Of course, the internet is this amazing transformative technology. It just took 15 year years longer than everyone expected. So what makes me nervous is like, if everyone's like, okay, so we have Microsoft at 3 trillion, we have Apple at 3 trillion, which really doesn't, I mean, they've been investing billions and billions of dollars in machine learning, but they don't really have any generative AI, AI that you can point to right now. I just worry that everybody is so loaded up on the same trade based on just a little flip of a switch, you know what I mean, yeah. earlier this year. Look at Google, they're tripping all over themselves, right? As far as Bard in the beginning of this year, Gemini at the end of this year. It doesn't seem like this is a company that said they are an AI first company six or seven years ago. It doesn't seem like they have their finger on the pulse. So I'm just worried though, if I think about all of those hundreds of billions that have been earmarked in the private markets at valuations that are probably eye popping to you guys, and people are okay with Microsoft and Apple trading at 35 times for expected high single digits growth, you know what I mean? With probably not that much margin improvement going forward, it seems like there is a massive bubble that is brewing right now. Yes, and the word that you just said, expectations. So this is all about expectations. The, the rates conversation that we started the, 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 uh, the, the podcast with, is all about expectations. Expectations that the Fed is, I think in your words, you said, you know, going to aggressively lower. We're going into a third year presidential election, yeah. almost definitely, even though the Fed's supposed to be independent. Of course, yeah. the Economic Council of Advisors, of course, the White House is going to pressure Powell. Of course, they're going to try to inflate the stock market and get a wealth effect that's happened every time, you know, that through presidential elections. However, on that front, people still feel, even though their stock portfolio may be increasing, and my God, animal spirits are back, they still see prices going and raising and lowering rates, should the Fed do that, uh, or signal that they do that, gives producers the ability to continue to raise prices and inflation is going to continue. So people will still feel, even though they're uh, financially, materially, empirically better off, they will still feel poor because they see the prices, particularly right. for the masses. So expectations matter. Expectations on AI and tech valuations matter too. Now, four years ago, nobody thought that Microsoft was going to be the leader in this, right? And and Satya, like they have crushed it. They did good, smart deals. Mm -hmm. They've rolled it out successfully. They're shipping products. They're producing new stuff. They became more relevant than they ever were 
in the past four years, whereas Google, which was the most relevant, like your point, is now sort of playing catch up. Now, maybe with the multimodal effects of Gemini, you end up saying, oh my gosh, like they are just absolutely crushing. So all of that stuff is up for grabs. Where I do think that positive surprise exists, and this is almost a broader point for me, because even though I am wearing black, I've sort of denoted this very intentional point. Everybody that I talk to is negative. They are negative about geopolitics. They are negative about the economy. They're negative about our presidential octogenarian candidates. They're negative about war. They're, like, everybody is negative. Very few people are positive. And that actually makes me optimistic. Not in a naive way of like, you know, uh, Buffett, uh, uh, be fearful when others are greedy yeah. and greedy when others are fearful, or like in a more even cynical Baron Rothschild, you know, the time to buy is when there's blood in the streets. Yeah. But just like the fact that I see everybody so negative, the opportunity for incremental positive surprise to me seems more probable than negative surprise. The negative surprise is we, we you know, obviously we, we don't know because they're black swans, but most of the things that people are really worried about are like sort of baked in. Positive surprises, we haven't really seen Microsoft, Google, Meta at all get into biology, yeah. get into biotechnology. That's a huge market. So further upside on suddenly, I mean, you think about something like Ozempic. That took the world by surprise. I think a lot about it. Yeah. <laughs> you? Row body over right. here, buddy. Well, I mean, you, since I mean, the last time I- you Looking, know, like, looking no good. So I, I will tell you this, that is, I was at a I was at a dinner. It was actually very sadly. It was probably one of the last dinners that Byron Ween was yes. at. This was in September, really and it was a, a closed door thing. And there was like a few folks like you, a few media folks, investors, and the like. And you know, it was interesting. We all went around the table. There's about 20 people there, and went around the table. One thing that you're pessimistic about, yes. and one thing you're optimistic about. And it was interesting. Um, he was actually, the last thing I heard him say was he was very pessimistic about this growing uh, national debt and deficit. And, yeah. and I think that's interesting in this environment right now where we're really going to like reflate a whole heck of a lot of the problems that we had. Um, that was his thing. But two people, and, and before they got to me, were very optimistic about Ozempic, GLP-1s, right? And, and, and so I thought that was, and, but for the purposes, their own um, experience with them, but also what it has to do for the potential of the humankind and, and yes. that sort of thing. And so um, I, I just, it's interesting that you I, I have that. family members that went on and were on seven different medications yeah. and now are on one. It's it's remarkable. That Just, you know, that's me in 11 months. I've lost it, 35 pounds. And incredible. all of those sorts of, you know, like I'm 51 years old, all the things that 51 year old men get nervous about later on in their life. Incredible. You know what I mean? And and again, our fine sponsor, Roe, over here, I've been doing it through Roe. Zach is and that, amazing. That, that, that whole process, though, for me, it manages it from the ability, you know, from the very beginning, the telehealth experience to the dealing with insurance to the, um, you know, nutrition and, and all the things that are gone. You know, to me, it's been life changing. But uh, two, two quick things. One, yeah. that health dividend is incredible. Yep. I believe that there's a health dividend that's coming, which, and again, all the cheerleading that we do as VCs, like this is gonna be the next big area. And like all the cheerleading that, you know, anybody that's a NASDAQ comment has, you know, the, 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 your Tesla's going to move. Ozempic came quietly. Yeah. It was just science and it snuck up on people. And then it reacted with, oh my God, this is incredible, right? Until everybody on the Upper East Side is like, you know, uh, whatever the zip code is, is like the highest concentration, yeah. you know, yeah. the, the, okay. So, uh, <laughs> but but the, the interesting thing about that is that science doesn't need promotion. It yeah. just, works and it creeps up on you. And so I actually think the next dividend that's going to come, that's going to shock people. And there's massive tailwinds for the demographics of this is in neuro. You think about Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, yeah. so many uh, neurodegenerative diseases. I think we're going to have an ozempic like moment in neuro in the next few years. And I think that people are just going to be like, my gosh, about brain. And that's health. AI driven. Basically. I don't know if it's AI driven. I think it just may be hardcore biotech. Biotech may benefit from AI as a tool that increases their productivity. But I just think it's like hardcore biotech pharma folks. And we're investing in some of these folks like Kyle Neuro and and others, Icon, that that I just think are on the cusp of big breakthroughs in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. where people have left this for dead for 20 years because everything has failed. Yeah. So um, now, by the way, just as a quick aside, because you mentioned Roe. Yeah. This was a great example of like uh, coopetition, competition, errors of omission, whatever. Zach from Roe is he's amazing. Yeah. He's an incredible entrepreneur, incredibly honest, incredible operator, incredible salesperson. I don't know if you know this. I think you may know this. We offered him, I think it was 20 on a 40 or 50. And we lost it to Firstmark because you guys did it at a slightly higher valuation. They won. It was, it was an amazing I deal. I think they based it on looks, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but but we, we and, and we were, were trying to be cute and say like, okay, like, you know, let them go. That's too crazy of a price or like whatever. And and that was an error of omission. We missed that one. And, and so kudos to Firstmark because they, they got that. And Zach's a great entrepreneur. Yeah. All right. Let's talk a little bit um, about 2024. Um, you know, here we are, we're coming into year end. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, that pessimism, Josh, that you described has powered a, a lot of things that, that have gone on in public and private markets and the like. And you heard me talk a little bit about this kind of mirror opposite 2023 from 2022. And there's a whole host of comparisons. We don't have to list them. 
you know, Rick, I'm just curious, like, how, how are you thinking about it? I know you're doing a lot of year end planning. You're doing yeah. a lot of thought about the new year. You're thinking about big trends, some things you want to let go of and that sort of thing. So I'm just curious, like, are you um, optimistic heading into 2024? Um, and again, I think, Josh, you made a great point. A lot of people and, you know, under the prior administration, remember every new high in the stock market at 401, we had a tweet, you're welcome, yeah. America. Right, exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. Which was kind of goofy for yeah. all intents yeah. and purposes. But it is something that people see. But it's well, it actually, it doesn't seem to be doing a whole heck of a lot for positive sentiment in and around. Just look at the polling that's going on as it relates to the election. But anyway, what Josh said and what you're implying, you know, it's, it's the economy, stupid, right? Yeah. So as you think about politics, and you think about some of the messages that people are going to hear, it's the economy and whether people can't afford to move to that new house, even though they had another kid because mortgage rates are up or their 401k is down or they're, you know, if they can't keep up with inflation, all these little pieces in these six states that matter are really going to be hammered home. Yeah. So I think for all the reasons that Josh was talking about, I think you're going to see a decline in rates. I think there's going to be some things that will change people's perception of the economy. And I think that'll benefit the market. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think there was probably some counter programming when the last president took took full credit for everything that was going on in the market. Uh, our current president has, has veered away from that and is focused more on some other issues. But I think that's going to come together where everybody knows it's the economy, stupid. And yeah. I think that'll be a, a real focus in the next year from a, a global macro perspective and political perspective from my little micro perspective as we're thinking about, you know, going through to your question of how are we advising, you know, our boards, our CEOs, our companies going into the year, we think it's still going to be a, a bit choppy. And, yeah. you know, we think that, you know, although things seem to be lining up for, for a nice year, for all the things you talked about, you know, rates are going to come down. You're going to see a more normalized enterprise buying environment mm -hmm. after a lot of uh, cost cutting on both the people side mm -hmm. and OPEX side over the last period of time. You're going to see, um, you know, consumers feeling very healthy, and you know, I'm sure you've seen all the B of A things were that were tweeted out over the last period of time, where there is there is a real wealth effect going on. There is there has been a savings where people are willing to spend that money. Unemployment stays low, so a lot of macro things are, are coming together, and we just want our companies who might be a little bit rattled from the last two years to say it's going to be a difficult financing time vast majority of our companies are fully financed. And that's that's the most important thing because you want to be able to control your own destiny. And so, hey, how do you control your own destiny? How do you figure out how to get from here to there? How do you focus on not only the, 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 the steps you took to get fit, but making sure that you're taking those steps to get to the next level and whether that's an M&A exit or a public financing in the next couple of years? Yeah. And how do you get from here to there and then how, how do you take advantage of this market, especially the best companies who have the ability to play offense and not defense in that market, to be an accumulator of both financial capital and human capital? So how do you, how do you play offense and, and buy companies which might not be as strong, which might, might, which might not have the right TAM or might not have the right balance sheet? And how do you get people who you could convince that, you know, either literally or figuratively yeah. that they should take a, sh a seat on the rocket ship. Yeah, and I want to push back on one thing, though. I, I think the most dangerous um, group think out there right now is that the, the mission accomplished and the soft landing has been achieved as we head into 2024. And I think that's the one thing that could really be a curveball for um, lots of folks, whether you're an operator, whether you're an investor, because if you just think of sort of, and, and Josh, you as a contrarian, you'd like people to come around to your contrarian thought the fact that the markets are screaming, you know what I mean? Public markets right now are screaming soft landing, you know, recession pushed out and the like. I'll go the other way. So, so rates have gone ahead of what the Fed is kind of suggesting here. If rates go low too fast, okay, and restokes inflation, inflation is a cumulative game. I know you know math. I hear you do a lot of it. You know what I mean? So if wage inflation is not keeping up with what the cumulative effects of um, inflation have been on goods and services, then we got a real problem, in my opinion, because the last piece of the puzzle is that unemployment has not ticked up meaningfully, right? If yep. anything, it's gone down a little bit, 3.7%. If we have in 2024, unemployment tick up because let's say consumer is stretched. We're seeing savings being drawn. We're seeing consumer credit at all time highs. We're seeing rotate. So we're going to start seeing um, obviously folks having to pay, you know what I mean? Um, on uh, When they come off the fixed rates at much higher rates, even though we've seen yields come down, I think it sets up for a really nasty 2024. I don't mean like deep, deep recession, but right now, Nobody is pricing in a recession. And last year at this time, everybody was. And look what happened. I, I agree with you. I'm going to give you uh, one or two contrarian, maybe provocative ideas. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be a labor-driven recession. 
Uh, so it's not going to be supply shock. It's not going to be demand shock. It's going to be a labor-driven assessment. What happens? To your point, wages need to keep up with inflation. Wages are in part driven by employee demand and um, uh, demands and union power. Mm -hmm. I uh, wrote a piece in Barron's uh, two months ago or so, uh, op-ed, that was basically highlighting the fact that we have record low participation unions, 10%. Relative to historic, 30, 40, 50% participation units, record high support for unions. That is a gap that is going to change. You are seeing a summer of strikes that have taken place. You've seen it from UPS to efforts to organize Tesla overseas and other places. The UAW has just like the tactics that they've used. Like this is an insurgency force that has moved with speed, organization, effectiveness, it's just been remarkable. And I don't think people appreciate this. And there's two facets of this that occur. Number one, it helps Joe Biden. Joe Biden is a friend of labor. And he will rally. I mean, he's the first U.S. president to stand with UAW mm -hmm. and basically say, like, help our people, right? Work in the factory lines. That is a pretty large force, right? It's, it's, it's a large male force, but there's a pretty large force of some key battleground states where you have lots of workers. And if he is supporting higher wages and better health care, uh, I think that, that you're going to see a, a, a continued labor movement. Now, there's two effects of that. One, if you're an investor, healthcare IT, healthcare services, they may be indirect or direct beneficiaries because when labor wins, you get higher wages and you get more benefits. And more benefits is more healthcare mm -hmm. services. And that could be everything for women from egg freezing and fertility services to mental health to just better- uh, GLP-1s. Exactly, exactly. Okay, the second piece of this, which I think is interesting, is you will have some companies that shock people that go bankrupt. My candidate, UPS. Wow. UPS yeah. will be bankrupt, I think, in the next two years. Based on the labor deal they just did. Based on the labor deal they did. And one of my favorite companies, Amazon. Amazon went from zero direct delivery packages to $5.9 yeah. more than what UPS is delivering, more than what FedEx is delivering. So you just look at that. I mean, I love the the men and women in their, in their brown suits. Mm -hmm. But UPS, there was a thing that went viral on TikTok, I think, a week ago that showed one of the workers showing his pay stub and people are like, my God, I'm in the wrong business. Like the reaction Teachers was not- quitting to Right, like UPS. I want to go be UPS. But, so what happens there? Wages go up, margins are getting compressed. It's happened in the auto companies. It's happened in the airlines. Why won't it happen in our package delivery? And when that happens, you're talking about 300,000 plus workers that were striking. That's going to have a ripple effect on the economy. Well, will Amazon be allowed, let's say, to pay $130 billion for a UPS from a regulatory standpoint? Let's just say to your point, 500,000 employees at UPS. Okay, so Amazon's one of the largest employers why, here. Why but, would they want but that if it contract? Needs to be saved. Yeah, Amazon, Amazon won't buy it. A a Amazon will, will do what they For years, there were rumors about FedEx and yeah, the like, sure. you know, that sort of thing. And now they've, they've built out the logistics. Yeah. And the right, and, and Amazon has basically said, like, we can do this better. We don't have yeah. legacy stuff. Yeah. We don't have the infrastructure. Yeah. We can do it faster. It's like, you know, buying something with like Lotus Notes versus yes. like, you know, cutting edge like PyTorch. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I am bullish on Amazon taking market share and value, and I think it's going to be value destroying for UPS. And again, my prediction, yeah. again, 30 to 50% of venture firms that currently exist out in the next few years, UPS files for bankruptcy. You know, Josh, we started this year, there was a great article in the information. It was Josh Wolf's War, yes. and, and it was a fascinating, I actually sent it around to a whole host of folks. I just thought it was really interesting. And when we talked last uh, on the pod in mid-2022, we spent a lot of time talking about some of the companies that you just kind of uh, discussed Andrew and, and Sail Drone and the like here. Talk to us a little bit about how you're feeling heading into 2024 because the, the geopolitical hotspots, um, they are not cooling down by any means. And when you look at the alignment between Russia, Iran, and China, you see this through line here. And, and, and your focus is really how America is positioned, right, to deal with these emerging threats. So talk to us a little bit, I guess, I guess from an investment standpoint, but I know that this is not just about dollars and X's and O's. So, um, by the way, going into 2024, my basic strategy on venture investing, three simple things. Um, I call it bubble, anti-bubble consolidation. Bubble, put companies in a protective bubble so they don't have to deal with the volatility and vicissitudes of markets, all the chaos that's happening. Just basically protect them for two or three years and fund new co's that are doing crazy stuff in science that the markets you know, will care about in two yep. or three years. Uh, anti-bubble, now that the market's crashed in many cases, can you get assets that are later stage but invest at Series A stage prices? Mm -hmm. And so you need divestitures, recap, spinoffs. We've done two of those. One from Google. I took out a company called Osmo that is giving machines a sense of smell like Shazam for computers, which is pretty cool. And the other out of Meta, which hasn't really been publicly announced yet, but is their AI for biotech piece. And I took a 12-person team. There are going to be dozens of those kinds of companies that we and, and First Mark and others can spin out mm -hmm. divisions and put them into venture business. The third, which we already talked about, consolidation. War chest balance sheets consolidate the weaker competitors. On aerospace defense, geopolitics, there's Crink and s &M. What is Crink and s &M? China, Russia, uh, Iran, North Korea, s and Sahel and Maghreb. That's the part of Africa 
Wayne well, was thinking something else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was like, what's my kink again? I couldn't remember. Crank and sorry, S&M, sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, so uh, at, at S&M, Sahel and Maghreb, this is the areas in Africa where you're seeing coup after coup after yeah. coup. You're seeing Russian mercenaries and Wagner come in for exploitation. You're seeing China on the coasts, basically geopolitical influence. But it is massive instability. All of those things have one common interest. China, Russia, uh, Iran, North Korea destabilize Western interests. We have basically been on the back foot. We have disengaged from the world. I think it would be terrible, whoever is elected president, for us to lose that hegemony, to lose that policeman of the world, the moral values, the beacon light on the shining hill. So I think it's important that we're engaged, propping up allies. We don't always do it right. In some cases, we do it terribly, but I think that's critically important. Uh, we are seeing real live testbed in Ukraine of off-the-shelf technology, of open source intel, of drones. We've never had that kind of warfare before where you're seeing the integration of technology from large-scale missile systems to small-scale drones to open source intel that's being sourced from the internet and triangulating to people and um, uh, uh, decoding comm signals. That is like entirely new warfare. China, Taiwan, not a single shot is fired. Mm -hmm. I think in the next two or three years, Taiwan becomes Hong Kong. It basically, if I had to predict what would happen, you send 100 people a day, which I think they've been doing for years from Beijing to Taipei. You have a older gentleman that is in Taiwan that is attacked by some uh, uh, local person, and all of a sudden police come in to basically keep the peace, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's taken over the course of a weekend entirely peacefully. There's no, all the, right. all the materiel, all the uh, uh, sorties that they're flying, all the near provocations in the South China Sea and in the air, those are all meant to basically distract Can, can I ask you a question? Because that, that's really fascinating. In, in, in that scenario, um, is it something where there is no disruption to uh, chip making and the like? And some, like, like, if you think about it, like, I mean, the U.S. multinationals have been operating under that situation in China, you know what I mean? Um, with their work, it's worked really well. I, 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 I think that there will be minimal disruption and maximum leverage. Minimal disruption in the chip production, but China will control a major means of the source of production for people. And just like now, like you don't see Elon, you know, critically talking about China. Why? Because he has interests there. And so once you control the means of production, you can control the information. Is that a huge problem? It you is know, a Andrew Ross Sorkin in that fucking bizarro interview yes. of Elon, he asked the one question that we've been talking about on our pod, and we talked about it with you 18 months ago. Elon evaded it's it. like the the leverage yes. that the Chinese have over him because of Shanghai Gigafactory, because the access to rare earth materials, manufacturing, but also their consumers. Throw Starlink in there if there's a scenario with Taiwan that doesn't go, that looks more like Ukraine, right? Like he is so conflicted in a way. But I think of our country, I, even with it, we don't have to flex our military might to avoid Taiwan being taken over by by China. That is a really bad situation yes. for U.S. For, for all the issues that we've been talking about for decades with forced technology transfer and the like, and then their access to catch up to us as it relates to AI and the implications of how that will be used for their military, yeah. right? So, I mean, like, listen, we could go on and on for that. That is, although there are no shots fired, it might be an even worse situation for us if the, the, the Taiwanese are not able to defend themselves. And we have come out and said, and President Biden, I give him a lot of credit for doing this, and said he's gone much further than any of his predecessors to say that we'll defend uh, the Taiwan sovereignty. Yeah, and, and all the saber rattling and all the words that are said at the end of the day, if China wants Taiwan, they're going to take yeah. it. And and they do want it. And it's just a matter of time and how. What we can do is global resilience in a sense of, you know, just general catalyst talks about it, really domestic resilience, rebuilding our arsenal of democracy on the weapon side and on defense side, rebuilding our biotech manufacturing, our own chip manufacturing. This is going to take a generation. This is not going to happen in two years in Arizona with the CHIPS Act. CHIPS Act is good. Yeah. It's noble. You have to get a flood of capital. All the infrastructure dollars that are you know focused on reinvigorating American infrastructure should really be focused on infrastructure for technology. Uh, and then the other thing is is investing overseas, not in China. There's, I mean, there's going to be a massive de-risking, decoupling, whatever you want to call it, of money that went in there to prop up things that are now being used against us. But some of our best allies in the region, in Korea, in Japan, we're about to announce a very big deal in Japan on AI. Mm -hmm. We're very bullish about the ex-China Asian allies that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that US investors should be encouraged to be making those investments because they will be see seeing tailwinds, not just in Asia, yeah. but Europe, even parts of Africa, South America, there's a big opportunity for our, our US. I hate allies. to bum you out, man. But but if Trump wins, and um, I think, you know, funding for Ukraine goes away, and we lose a, a very important sort of battle yes. um, that's been fought now for nearly two years yes, at yep. a tremendous cost. Okay, um, what's happened with us pulling out of the Iran deal? 
disaster as it relates to what's gone on in the Middle East over the last, you know, let's call it year or so. Okay. And, and obviously Netanyahu, you know, disaster in my opinion. And then if you think about if we lose this thing as it relates to China, um, you know what I mean? And Taiwan, I mean, like, like the, the nationalistic tendencies, right? Like that, 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 might exist in a year or two from now have the, the ability, in my opinion, to push the U.S. back on so many different levels on a lot of things that you guys are prioritizing in the way you think about the investment landscape. More more broadly than the investment landscape, just America on the whole. Well, yes. yeah, I mean, I, it sounds kind of cheesy to kind of <laughs> narrow it down from an investment standpoint, but like, I, I mean, like literally, I think there is so much at stake here. And I'm going to tell, all right, here's one last thing, and then we can get out of here. With what just happened, okay, with these billionaire donors, okay, to my alma mater, to your alma mater, yeah. you know, this, that, whatever. I think what needs to happen right now, we spent a lot of time talking about, there's a lot of good things going on in the economy and the Biden administration is getting no credit for it, largely because I don't think they have particularly good surrogates. I don't think they have a tight narrative in and around it and that sort of thing. I'd like to see these billionaire donors who basically forced out the president of Penn and, and, and are gonna affect change on these campuses. I'd like them to see them do that to this administration partially because they don't have the team that is ready for this fight. And I think it is an existential fight. If you think of, and I've heard you talk about this, Josh, the disarray that is happening here in the U.S. is emboldening our adversaries 100%. abroad. And I think that if we are just going to whistle by the graveyard and let this administration take on what's building on the other side right now, and it is building, it is a groundswell that's going on. And you can say all you want about Joe Biden standing with the UAW workers, it's going to come down again to 80,000 votes yeah. in four states, yeah. okay? And a handful and, of counties. Yeah, so. and, and to me, like that, we are risking the future, I think, of all these great things that you guys are optimistic about, about our country right now. Look, I'll, I'll tell you the, you know, a, 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 every negative thing ends up having often a positive reaction, right? That's the the sort of conditional optimist in yeah. me. Um, you know, Trump said terrible things about women. You had record numbers of women yeah. run for and win in Congress. And so, and so there's always some sort of counter reaction. We're seeing a counter reaction right now to the campus reaction to the atrocities in Israel mm -hmm. and people just being like, my God, like this red green alliance that existed, this sort of Marxist sensibility, like this has to be undone. People mm -hmm. have to learn American history. Mm -hmm. We have to understand the values that we're standing up for and fighting for the technology, the economics, the education, the re-education of American society is important. I will give you one thing that I actually would be a massive positive surprise that is on virtually nobody's uh, radar, which would be like we had in Arab Spring years ago, mm -hmm. which was sort of stunted in many cases. Were you to have the end of a theocracy mm -hmm. in Iran, mm -hmm. you would have a flood of Iranian Americans and American Iranians and people globally, and it might be the greatest renaissance for Eastern Europe, you know, and mm -hmm. and and the Mideast uh, to see Iran free of uh, Khomeini. Uh, it would just be an absolute flourishing thing. They would become, you know, the greatest ally. You, it would be the most amazing stabilizing thing. Yeah, but that only happens. Mark Esper was on Kara Swisher's pod last week. You know, Trump wanted to bomb the shit out of Iran, right. you know, right before he left. That only happens in a very destabilizing war for the region. And we've already done that. And we know what that's led to Look, over the last 20 years. Po political candidate stuff is, if it were me, we would have Romney and Bloomberg. But you understand my point? Right. I think the billionaire class who are supportive of, you know, like, well, you know, of Democrats, I think they need to actually do the same thing right now. Because you know what? The Iowa caucuses are in three freaking weeks yes. okay so the, the, the we know who the candidates are, are going to be right we use assumption uh, that we have to change that right now in it well i think i, I don't think the, i don't think it's gonna be trump or biden okay well, how I think does it's that happen both. i think it, well you can't change them now until the uh, well no no until the trump thing them. can change because there is a primary that's going on and then there will be you know the, think about the all convention. the indictments and the convention and all that sort of thing the democrat the, the dnc has rigged it right now so there is actually no possible way under the existing right. rules to put another candidate you don't know I mean on the ballots of 50 states for the most part here yeah. so that's what i'm worried about and listen i love joe biden he rid us of one of i think one of the worst evils that our country has seen easily in my lifetime but probably in the last 100 years but he is not the fighter to do what i think has to come next and i just think that how is a change going to be affected people need to speak up the way they just well, did over the last month or so and, and i think that'll president. be the, yes 
No, there's no. <laughs> no I, I mean, I just listen. No, no, I'm just going to say this. Yeah, you yeah. know, l- l- let me make, let me make one other point. OK, I have a lot of friends who listen to our pods and they're very frustrated with my market commentary over the last year. And I am frustrated with it for a whole host of reasons. I've gotten a lot of things right, but I've gotten one monolithic thing wrong about the direction, let's say, of the S&P or the Nasdaq. I believe a lot of things that I have said will prove to be right over the next year or two. But that's really difficult in a mark to market environment. And I'm talking every day showing up and doing this, whether it's market call, whether it's on the tape, whether it's OK computer, whether it's fast money. And I'm here when I'm right or when I'm wrong. But the one thing, you know what I mean, that that I'm kind of worried about at this moment is that, like, you know, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts, whether it be political folks and this that, that I have a ton of respect for. We are whistling past the graveyard right now. And if it doesn't happen at this moment and those guys are so pissed off about what went on in their campuses by a minority of students. OK, and a minority of the faculty who did not show, I think, the ability to act in the proper way, then why won't they take something that I believe is far more serious about the future of our country and, and really, you know, kind of, you know, I think it's still early. I think there's going to be the opportunity for people to act. People are mobilizing. Uh, I, I have confidence in the American. Are they voters. mobilizing? I, I think the only sure. hope that we have is that you know Joe Biden can't physically run. I mean, that's the no. saddest thing about. Do you understand what it's I'm saying? True. And I don't know. I don't want to wish for that. Is what I'm saying. And I don't want to be. I don't want Kamala Harris to be anointed either. You know what I mean? Because that's what happens if there's too much time that passes. If there's not the proper ability well, well, for a the democratic there, there's a there's a bunch of things that could happen. But I think the the president will still be able to Im- improve his narrative in 24, get to a place where you could pull together the narrative, what's going right in the world, which is a lot, and what he's done, which has been a lot, and get from here to there and be able to talk to those certain counties and those certain states and those certain demographics. And it's, you know, somewhere between 74 and 174,000 people who amazingly are going to decide this race. And the, those people have to get the, have to get a message. And there's plenty of time. Yeah. to get them that Well, message. I'll just say it. Newsom um, is the fighter. Whitmer's the one who delivers Michigan. And that's what the ticket should be right now. And so I know I got a little hot. I got a little hot there. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the other thing I want to say is, um, and lastly, and we, I you promise, just want to be on the record with it, with, with your, uh, I, I, your I, I like the, you know, no, I, you know, listen, I have a lot of friends who are doing a lot of really great work in the political. Side. I think they're whistling past the graveyard right now. They don't want to disturb the apple cart a little bit, but I just last thing, and we don't have to get any, any specific. Josh, your voice um, about what's gone on in the Middle East, uh, specifically in Israel. Um, you've been very public about it. I'm sure you've gotten a lot of blowback here and there. I'm sure you've gotten a lot of support. You kind of alluded to that in some other angles, but I think it's really refreshing to see your openness about it. Um, so uh, kudos to you, my Thank man. You. All right. Well, listen, thank you for joining us. I know that we ran out of time here. I I wish we could do it um, more frequently. To be be continued. We should. Yeah. yeah, Thank you, This is part one. Part one. Part part one. Let's do it again. Part two coming soon. All right. Thanks, guys. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you.